Bless God. Right now I'd like to talk about Philippians chapter 3. And if someone has been abusing this passage for long enough, they must be doing it on purpose. Okay, at this point. Because Paul's point here is rather simple. And we even find the wording elsewhere in the Word of God. That Paul, he was talking to the Philippians about endurance okay and Paul is attesting to the fact that he's actually perfect inwardly he's not sinning and I understand people have to give up the Romans 7 thing immediately if they're just going to take what the passage means and most people don't do that so then they go on to just misuse the passage such as saying well I'm not perfect in verse 12, although he says he is perfect in verse 15. So what does that actually mean then? Well, what it actually means is that what it says is that Paul, he is saying something obvious that I'm not in an immortal body. I have not endured to the end. Okay. But I have initial salvation. I'm morally perfect. I'm not sinning. That's what initial salvation is, is that you're not sinning and you've been forgiven of the past sins. That's initial salvation right there. And it would also be a current salvation. And he's speaking currently in the spirit of God. But he also knows that I must endure. Okay. Now the wording is used in the Bible in Hebrews chapter 5. I'll go to the ninth verse. It says, and being made perfect. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Now, right here, you have it all, okay? Because Jesus even had to be made perfect. Well, that can't mean Jesus had to be made of someone not sinning. Jesus never sinned, so it can't mean that. But what it does mean is that Jesus is in a resurrected body, a glorified body, and he's operating as the high priest in the flesh in an immortal body. So that's the perfection that is spoke of here. And that's the perfection that Paul is speaking of in Philippians 3.12. Upon rejecting this, it doesn't matter how many times you've slandered it in the past, you're worthy of a horrible suffering in hell. Because you've rejected now the gospel, because that's what it says in verse 9 of Hebrews 5. And in verse 8, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Did he learn obedience through being disobedient before? Absolutely not. But what did he learn? He learned endurance. Okay. So what is this man the author of? Eternal salvation, of course. To who? To those that obey him. So we see Paul was fully obedient. Romans 7 is a testimony about being a Pharisee. And the passage just says it in the 15th verse. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if anything, and if in anything, excuse me, you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. So, in anything else than perfection, you're otherwise minded, let God reveal it. So... Paul's saying that you don't have any excuse. Okay. Paul does say this is something I have already attained, though, and that is this moral perfection, that we walk by this rule, that we mind this same thing. Okay. How much so is he saying this in verse 17? Brethren, be followers together of me. How can a mere man possibly make this statement? It's quite bold. But yet, he had liberty to make this statement only because of Jesus, because he's actually listening to everything Jesus says. So when you follow Paul on a moral level, you're actually following what Jesus is saying. That's why he can say this. Why? And mark them which walk so, as ye have us for an example. You have us He's not just saying himself, us. Now, he's just out of his mind if he's also sinning to say this. Okay. There's nothing to follow there. Who would ever, 
actually go that far as to suggest, yeah, Paul was a Roman seven sinner as a Christian. And he's telling people to follow him. Come on. And he's talking about how you walk. What does it say in the psalm? Mark the perfect man. Well, that seems to line up there. Okay. So, before, in the passage, though, getting back to the 12th verse, okay, he does talk about, verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth onto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So, yes, he's talking about the resurrection of the just, but he's also fully disclosing that it's not just something determined upon his soul. That he must endure, that he must stay walking perfectly, that he must do this as Christ did it. And Jesus has the example already set. So anyone following Jesus goes by what Jesus said. You'll be as your master. It does not matter what was before. You have to forget all that and lay it all aside. So there's nothing for the devil to accuse justly, but rather falsely accusing. Okay? Past sins are past sins. Jesus never had past sins. The difference between us and Jesus when it comes to obedience is 1 John 1 8. Okay? But the difference of Hebrews 5 to Philippians 3 and what the scoffers are saying is... No difference at all. It's a lie. Okay. Hebrews 5 and Philippians 3 is what agrees that you have to be morally perfect. You have to stop sinning to even be saved. And you have to remain perfect. Okay. And from there, then you can talk about different things like in Hebrews. Okay how our high priest has compassion on the ignorant. These are different things and these are different stories, but you know what you do willfully. You know that you're willfully sinning right now. And you probably willfully changing the meaning of things like Philippians 3, Hebrews 10. And this you do to your own destruction. And there is no other teaching. There is no way out of this. You will be, of course, punish for this and you must stop the passage is easy it's not a hard passage okay and i mean it just is deep and deep and deep i mean because even in the ninth verse you see that paul believing and following perfection and obedience is as well saying it's not my own righteousness, okay? But it's faith. That's what faith must look like then, you know? I mean, that's what James taught. Faith is made perfect. So there's a constant completion to faith. And how? Just listen to God, okay? Forgetting those things that are past, that's the blood. Walking in the light, Right now in the current, not sinning, no darkness, no evil, that's the blood. Okay? And where do you end up? You end up where the high priest is who offered his own blood. But you have to endure to the end. And, I mean, the key here is this. Okay, let me finish with this. Okay? The devils know this. They know this truth. Okay, they know who Jesus is. They know who his are. They know, okay? The people that they are using to try to get at you, if they're using their common sense, they'll know this too by reading what God has said. They're going to hear all these different voices. Okay, there's going to be false pastors, hirelings, YouTube videos, okay? And they're going to tell you no one's perfect. Okay, and they're going to tell you 
Romans 7 and all these different things. So now you get someone who's sinning, the chances of them diverting from common sense, we see a lot of it, there's a good chance. So now you get into deception, searings, okay? There are some people that will tell you, I can stop sinning, I just choose not to. That is a person that actually has common sense on Bible verses. It's not very smart what they're doing, of course, and that's an understatement, and they do go to hell too. You just don't get by on a head knowledge, of course, but most people, they're going to try to find a way out of it, okay? And so now what the devil is going to try to do is he's going to try to get you on a lesser sin. If you've gone this far with Christ, he doesn't actually think he's going to get you to become Mormon or a Calvinist or a feminist. This is highly unlikely. There's a better chance he can get you on something smaller and he knows he can get you there. He can get you on something like that and he knows that that would be enough. Okay. So we just have to say no. The things that they say is enough to make you angry. So then the key is just not letting the sun go down upon your wrath. So just take it one step at a time. But it's going to give a righteous anger. I mean, I can't imagine how angry God is sometimes. Okay. Having a created mind. Okay. With limitation. God being everywhere and hearing this all the time. I mean, there's some people that just do it all the time, okay? And the devils don't sleep. And all the time, he's listening to people say these things. So, I really can't even actually grasp it, his anger, but he tells me about it, so that's what I go by. Okay, so I just let him talk to me about it, and I believe what he says. But I cannot fathom it, you know, being of the created order. I mean, how angry he must be. But that's the pity. And we preach that people have this pity that God is allowing them this chance to repent today and that God could reveal this. Okay. And the reason why people aren't having it revealed is because of their fault. I mean, God would have all men everywhere to repent. Okay, he'd have all men everywhere to be saved. Okay, but their stiffenings and the fact that they have no fear of God before them and these things is what's shutting them off from God revealing this truth because it's already been said, it's already out there, it's being preached, it's in the Word of God. You know, it's not like God hasn't tried. Okay, the gospel gets to every person that if you repent and you have faith, why aren't you perfect? I mean, how much do you just deplete and ignore repentance in the scriptures and what faith looks like to get to this? Well, yeah, we have repent and have faith and no one's perfect. I mean, it's a great folly. No one would ever using common sense, agree with something like this. Okay? Because even in life, if you say, I changed my mind toward even one thing, I have faith in this other thing, you're all the way in the other thing. I mean, everyone knows that. But yet, when it comes to the Bible, it gets worse and worse and worse, and it waxes worse. Okay? So, God's not revealing it in Paul's mind to these people because of what it says, for example, in like Proverbs chapter 1. Okay, you start maybe verse 22 and then you just read that they're refusing God. They hate knowledge. They don't choose to fear God. And in this case, you always end up twisting the gospel. So you hear the gospel and then you twist it. That's one way Satan snatches the real gospel out is through the person he's snatching it from twisting it. 
That's a great way because how many hang on to just the words on the pages? Okay, they hang on to what it says, but they twist what it says. Okay. So right there in Philippians 3, you have full measure of perfection in the gospel of initial, current, and final salvation. It speaks about the resurrection. Exact language we see in Hebrews 5, no problem. So you have to walk in these things, of course. And the righteousness of Christ and of God is taught in this passage as well. I mean, this is a full blowing weapon, okay, against the heretics. In Jesus' name, bless God.